Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey, and I'm the Executive Director of APA Ohio and the Vice Chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I will be the moderator for today's webcast. Today, Friday, October 18th, we will hear the presentation, Leaky Pipes. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the question box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. I would like to thank all of the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Wisconsin Chapter. For more information on this chapter and how to become a member, you can visit wisconsinplanners.org. And to learn more about all of our chapters, you can visit planning.org slash chapters. On your screen is a list of upcoming webcasts. To register for these webcasts, visit utah apa.org slash webcasts and we will be adding a few more for the rest of this season shortly. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, visit planning.org slash CM, select today's date and today's webcast. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credits. Like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on the Planning Webcast Series sponsored by Chapters and Divisions. We are recording today's webcast and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. A PDF of the PowerPoint is also available upon request by emailing me at planningwebcast at yahoo.com. And just an FYI, I have been having trouble with my email in the last three weeks. So if you have not heard a reply from me, they are coming in bulk um, after the fact. So I will get back to you if I have not yet. Okay. I'd now like to go ahead and introduce our two speakers for today so we can get this started. Our first speaker is Nancy Frank. She is the Associate Professor in the, De in the Department of Urban Planning at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Her research interests involve land use policies that preserve open space and reduce the development impacts on the environment, as well as local, regional, and state policies regarding water quality, water quantity, and aquatic ecosystems. She has substantial policy experience in relation to both water and brownfield cleanup and redevelopment. Through work funded by the Brico Fund, she facilitated a series of meetings that led to the creation of the Southeastern Wisconsin Watershed Trust. She now serves as chair. She also serves on the boards of the American Planning Association Wisconsin Chapter, the Energy Center of Wisconsin, and the Great Lakes Observ Observing System. Our second speaker is Cheryl Nunn. Before joining Milwaukee Riverkeeper, Cheryl consulted on environmental projects for the U.S. Forest Service and Wisconsin DOT wetland mitigation sites and helped manage forest restoration, reforestation, and erosion control projects for the City of New York, Department of Parks and Recreation. As Riverkeeper, Cheryl identifies sources of pollution to Milwaukee's rivers, actively patrols the rivers for issues of concern, and looks for collaborative solutions to these problems. Cheryl also manages the citizen-based water quality monitoring projects on Milwaukee's rivers and leads various restoration and stormwater demonstration projects. Cheryl serves on the technical advisory committees for Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission's Regional Water Quality M Management Plan and the Milwaukee River Estuary Area of Concern Remedial Action Plan. She has been a regional leader in Wisconsin for monitoring to find leaky sewer pipes. I'd like to now turn it over to Nancy who will begin our presentation. All right, hello everybody. Um, I want to start um, my presentation actually by um, talking about the people who really have made this possible because I knew nothing about the problem of leaky pipes and its connection to public health and um, certainly didn't have any reason to, to think that I needed to tell more planners about it if it weren't for the work of the people on this slide. So here in Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District 
um, and especially their executive director, Kevin Schaefer, have been real leaders in looking for leaky pipes for a host of, of water quality reasons that we'll talk about later. Uh, and they've partnered with Milwaukee Riverkeeper, where Cheryl works, um, to do a lot of the monitoring and ferreting out where the fecal is coming from in our watersheds. Um, we also have a lot of, of gratitude to give to Sandra McClellan at the UWM School of Freshwater Sciences, who actually does the uh, genetic testing that tells us that the fecal that we're finding in our, our streams and in our stormwater pipes is from a human source. And uh, Mark Gorlick at the Emergency Medicine Department at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin has also tried to estimate what this means in terms of people actually getting sick here in the Milwaukee area. So um, great kudos to them for their pioneering work. What we're going to be talking about today is the problem that I want you to become aware of. We're going to talk about the causes of the problem and what the scope of that problem is, as well as what the effects are on public health. You know, planning historically uh, has a mission to protect public health as well as safety and, and welfare. And here we have a potentially serious health risk right beneath our feet, and planners have important roles to play. So we're going to talk about what their current role is and then really move very quickly beyond their current role to look at what potential roles they might play in helping to solve this public health problem. And we're going to look at some specific policy options and some examples of places that you can uh, look into where they're already taking some of these policy approaches. So the problem has been recognized nationally in, in sort of a, a large macro sense uh, with the American Water Works Association and the American Society of Civil Engineers identifying this huge deficit that we have in our water infrastructure. It's a monetary deficit and it's also an effectiveness deficit. And, um, there doesn't appear to be a great deal of movement on getting more funding to fix our water infrastructure. Typically when infrastructure has come up over the last several years is we've been looking for ways to spend um, federal funds to help uh, juice the economy a bit. It's been roads and bridges that people have mainly talked about, much less water infrastructure. Um, I want to talk a little bit more in a more detailed way about the specific problem that we are going to be looking at today. So this image is really identifying three ways that sewer, well sewage, that's the word for it, sewage gets into our groundwater, into our surface water, and even in some cases into our drinking water coming out of the tap. So there are basically three different issues that we're going to be talking about today. One is illicit connections. And if you look, and look at my cursor here, I'm, I'm putting it under the problem now so you can see it, and then we're going to go over here. This is an example of an illicit connection where you have um, the sewage pipes from a home or a business directly connected generally by accident. Uh, sometimes there may be a, a little bit of uh, knowledge by the plumber who actually had done this, but normally by accident. Um, and when people take a shower, use the dishwasher, and flush the toilet, that water goes directly into a storm pipe because that's where the water was actually connected to. Here in the Milwaukee area, we had quite a, a famous case where one of the expensive boxes in our brand new uh, baseball stadium turned out to have their toilet inadvertently directly connected to one of our storm drain pipes and that, that then went directly out into one of our rivers. So illicit connections are probably individually the the largest source of sewage getting into our walls. But on a, a sort of landscape scale, perhaps the bigger problem is sewers that are defective in some way 
they leak and they infiltrate into, well, I should actually say exfiltrate. This is called exfiltration. <clears throat> when the sewer water moves out of the sewer pipe, it then moves down and may enter a storm drain down gradient someplace, and then from there it goes directly out to surface water. Or in other cases, it just goes down, eventually hits the groundwater, and then the groundwater moves until it finds a surface water that it's recharging. And again, uh, the fecal can, depending on the distances it needs to travel, sometimes get directly into the creek. The more, mo probably most rare issue is when the sewers are leaking, exfiltrating, and then the sewage makes its way to a drinking water pipe. Now I know, I know, that it, it looks on the graphic as though the water is flowing uphill, and we know that water doesn't do that. But if you picture the water pipe um, being to a home or a business that's downhill from the sewer part, pipe that's leaking, you can see how that cross uh, infiltration might occur. And in fact, there's plenty of documented examples of that. And even though generally civil engineers will say, oh, the water pressure in the pipes um, keeps all of that stuff um, from underground from getting into the pipe. In fact, engineers have demonstrated that, that at times when the water pressure just drops in what's called a transient, that actually can um, allow the sewage to enter directly into the pipe. The chlorine that's added at the plant is intended to deal with that. That's, that's why we add chlorine, to make sure that the water continues to deal with bacteria that arise in the course of, um, I just lost my picture. Christine, do you know what happened? Hello? Yeah, I'm, we're yeah. still seeing your screen. Okay. Do you want to try okay, to advance? Well, I'm not. Okay. So, um, do you do you want to try to advance to your next slide? Nothing happened. Let me try this. Boy, I've got nothing. Oh, there. there oh, here there. we go. Okay. That was okay, bizarre. Me... I, that's not happened before. <laughs> no, that but, was very odd. Okay, so let's try. If you want to go to um, slideshow. Yeah, resume slideshow. Boy, this is very odd. I hope there's not something goofy about my internet connection going on here on campus. So let me just keep talking. Um, in the upper right corner of the slide that I was showing you with the graphic, I've got things just not working here. Um, the um, there's some figures cited from a couple of different academic studies done by civil engineering sorts of folks. Um, one study in Albuquerque estimated that per kilometer of pipe in Albuquerque, there was two liters of sewage exfiltrating uh, per second. And I always like to think of, you know, standing with a two liter bottle at the kitchen sink and how long does that take to fill up? Um, not, not that long. Um, and, and this is actually um, faster than that on a per kilometer basis. There's another study done in, done in Nottingham, England, where they found a, a substantially smaller rate of exfiltration. They found it to be between 50 and 500 liters per day um, per kilometer. So, substantially less. At any rate, <clears throat> that's the problem that we're looking at. Um, I'm wondering, Christine, if I should take two seconds to close my PowerPoint and reopen it? Yeah, you could give that a try, and um, if, if it's possible to try to email it to me, I can always run it, run your slides for you. But if okay. we, oh, something's going. Well, yeah, actually, there we go. Can you see that? Can you see it now? Yay! This is so okay. bizarre. I don't know what's going on. I can on. see it. You all can see you it. You guys in Milwaukee. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Let's, all, right. all right, here we go. We're looking good now. Okay, um, this slide I, I actually got from our local sewerage district. And the main point is that, um, and this is standard across the country, typically the miles of private laterals is almost equivalent to the miles of either regional or municipally owned sewers combined. And so um, while the regional sewer authorities and the municipalities are usually fairly good at keeping their sewer mains um, tight and fixed and monitored, um, the private laterals are really out of sight and out of mind. Um, and it's only recently that cities have really even begun to realize that they ought to be developing policies for looking at what's happening with the private laterals. Um, again, private laterals are those sewers that connect from the private home and, or business to the sewer main in the street. So ideally, we would generally have the stormwater pipe located above a sewer pipe so that gravity is working in our favor to keep that sewage water out of the stormwater pipe. And ideally, we put our water pipes into a separate trench. Um, in most places, the backfill uh, that we put around our underground water infrastructure is more porous and, um, and offers an a easier way for <clears throat> water to move than the surrounding soil. And so um, in some places where you have very tight soil, you can actually see these trenches kind of filling up like uh, bathtubs. But even in other places, um, the water in those trenches is going to move more readily than in the surrounding soil. But as you can see, in, in many places um, in cities, either because there are older areas that weren't designed as carefully, there's been a lot of renovation over the years, things change or they were improperly done to begin with, um, we find that things aren't ideal. And in fact, the sewer and the stormwater pipe are not separated in terms of elevation. And the water pipe is in the same trench or in a trench that, you know, 500 feet down the way is interconnected because there are two lines crossing. And so what happens is as it rains, you begin to see things begin to fill up. And if you've got a leaking sewer pipe, what has been leaking into that trench now begins to get lifted up by the stormwater. And eventually, it gets to the level of the stormwater pipe or the water pipe. And you see the effect that they can have in the way our sewer systems are frequently um, put together. Um, and so when you've got a leak in the sewer pipe, that water moves around. And this is also why we, we generally find that these problems become worse during rainy weather than during dry weather. But things happen during dry weather as well, which Cheryl will be talking about. Oops. So this is just to give you an idea of, of what this looks like. This is a screenshot from a YouTube video. This is a fairly catastrophic failure of a sewer pipe. And yet, the way that this was, was broken, it was still possible for sewage to move through the pipe. It wasn't causing basement backups. And so um, it, it's the sort of thing that can leak a lot of stuff um, over a long period of time without being noticed. This is from a video that was taken here in Milwaukee. Um, this is an example of something called inflow um, or infiltration. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. This is when it rains and that trench fills up with water and you start getting the water moving into the sewer pipe. Now what you have to picture is when the rain stops and you get dry weather and that sewer pipe is filled you know, 10% full, a third full, half full with sewage, any of those places where water is coming in towards the bottom of the pipe then become equally places where sewage is going to move out into the soil. So the causes of this problem of exfiltration from sewer pipes 
um, can be poor installation practices. As I said, either they weren't properly installed in the first place, um, whether it's the connecting of sewer pipes to stormwater pipes accidentally, or the crossing of trenches, or things not quite aligned correctly so that you don't have a good solid seal between the joints of the pipes. Um, aging pipes is another big part of the problem, and then connected to the aging pipes problem is that the replacement schedules are typically much too slow. So this is um, a graphic that shows that in 1980, about 70% of sewer pipes were thought to be in excellent condition, another 20% in poor condition or in good condition. By 2000, that had shrunk substantially. Now a, a sizable percentage were only fair, poor, or some very poor, or that their life had actually elapsed. And it's projected that by 2020, we're going to have um, a large proportion of our pipes being in poor, very poor, or that their lifetime has actually elapsed. And that is again because we're not getting that um, searching for where there are problems and replacing those pipes quickly enough. This is just another way of looking at aging pipes. You'll see it, it looks at it by region so that we've got um, different uh, aging of pipes in the northeast and midwest compared to the southeast and the southwest which tend to have newer development. But I do need to caution you that just because pipes are new does not mean that they're not uh, either exfiltrating or that there weren't connection problems when those were put together. So let's talk a little bit about what the effects are of these leaky pipes. One effect is something called inflow and infiltration, which is what that um, one video shot showed you where the water was coming in at a seam in the pipe. Um, this problem of inflow and infiltration occurs during rainy weather and it leads to sanitary sewer overflows where we get so much clean rainwater getting into our pipes that sewage pipes can't handle it. You get uh, basement backups which are really bad and then you get sanitary sewer overflows directly into rivers and streams which is obviously also bad. So, we know that leaky pipes are a problem because of the effects that they can have in rainy weather. What is not so often talked about um, in relation to the problem of inflow and infiltration is that it's sort of a what goes up must come down issue. That if you've got inflow and infiltration, you almost certainly also have this exfiltration of fecal matter. One of the effects of that is that we end up with high um, counts of fecal coliform in our rivers and on our beaches, and that means that we end up needing to restrict water recreation, um, and that's not good for tourism, not good for the economy, not good for property values. There are also obviously health issues. Um, the reason that we have sewer systems in the first place is because sewage is a source of waterborne disease. And um, so when we have sewage leaking out and getting directly into our waterways um, or even into our drinking water pipes, there is a real risk of disease. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. As people become aware that their water supply may be um, at risk because of uh, leaky pipes and what have you, very often people will think, well, then I'm only going to drink bottled water, and that will make me safer. In fact, studies have shown that bottled water has a higher risk of disease than tap water. And so um, to the extent that we focus as planners on helping to solve the problem of leaky pipes, I think it's really important that we also share this point that bottled water is not the answer. The bottled water typically comes from the same sorts of groundwater sources as, as our tap water often does, goes through less treatment, and is just as likely, if not more likely, to have various kinds of um, pathogens in them. And finally, there's an economic issue around water supply revenue loss and energy loss as well. 
I want to talk a little bit about what we've been finding locally that really helped us to understand that we needed to focus on this issue and that leads me to, to share this with you today. In 2010, we finished a couple of watershed restoration plans in our region. And in one of the watersheds, which is actually a somewhat, um, a watershed that developed somewhat later than the other one, uh, there were seven of 18 sub-watersheds where when they were doing the modeling to say, where is the fecal coliform coming from in these watersheds? Seven of the 18 sub-watersheds had a, a note by the engineers that the source was unknown. Um, oh, I said that wrong. Seven of 18 didn't have any unknown source. In 11 of them, in the majority of the sub-watersheds, 60 to 75 percent of the fecal coliform was from some unknown source. So the engineers are saying, not sure where it's coming from. In the Kinnikinnick River watershed, every single sub-watershed had 60 percent of the fecal load from an unknown source. Now, some of that may be around, you know, modeling isn't exactly like looking at things, but the engineers who did the modeling said these sources may be caused by illicit connections to the storm sewer, leaking sewers, or other unidentified sources. And when we asked them in person, where do you think this unknown is coming from, they said illicit connections and leaking sewer pipes. Because of the attention that we've had here in the Milwaukee area on the leaky pipe problem, uh, the local communities, in part because of a program I'll be telling you about uh, shortly, have been doing inspections of the private laterals in targeted areas where there's been a high degree of inflow and infiltration or that INI problem. So in one of these communities, Elm Grove, and this is a community that developed in the early 60s and in the 1970s, they inspected 76 private lateral pipes. 21 of them had major leaks. And a major leak meant that it was more than three gallons per minute. So again, you need to picture how much sewage that means is actually able to leak into the trench and from there move and migrate either into a storm sewer pipe that has a break or out into the river directly. An additional 20 had moderate leaks that didn't quite reach that level. So I'm going to turn it over now to Cheryl because she's the one who's actually literally had boots on the ground taking the water quality samples and doing the analysis. Thanks, Nancy. Um, this is Cheryl. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, really a case study of some of the work that we've been doing in, Mo in Milwaukee um, kind of surrounding this problem. So I guess um, kind of piggybacking on what Nancy was just saying, um, you know, we've gone through a very long um, watershed, you know, water quality management planning process here locally where we've essentially gone back, you know, to the data. Um, we've looked from 1975 to present you know, look through all of the data that we have for our region and for our rivers. And, you know, we're really trying to do a better job of figuring out, you know, where are our hot spots of contamination so that we can more effectively, you know, design policies and projects to, um, to solve a lot of those, those problems. So um, as part of our regional water quality management planning, um, when we were doing, running a lot of the bacteria models, and, and Nancy kind of mentioned this, a lot of our sub-watersheds were not calibrating. Um, and so what you're seeing here on the screen, and I'll see if I can get the cursor to work here, is the, the orange kind of spikes that you see are what was modeled by, the, by the, the planners essentially at our sewer pack, our Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission, um, for you know, what they expected fecal coliform levels to look like in both our upper portion of our watershed and the lower portion of our watershed, which is much more urban. Um, and you know, basically they, they run the models largely based on land use and, and the fecal that they expect coming off of the different land use types. And then, you know, we're, and then the little dots that you see are the actual data that was observed in the field um, by, by people. And, you know, they basically calibrate the models and make sure that the model, you know, realistically is giving us a sense of how much bacteria is in the river. Um, when we move to the lower Menominee, you can see on the right hand side, on the, well, I should go back. The upper Menominee, the, the data seemed to calibrate pretty well with, with the model runs, and we are pretty happy with that. So when you move on to the lower Menominee, which is our, more of our urban portion of our watershed, and I should say this watershed's about 75% urban or so, the Menominee. It's a fairly small 
um, watershed on the drains to the Milwaukee River Basin. Um, you know, the lower um, portion of the Menominee, the, you, again, you can see the model um, bacteria levels are in that orange. And then the actual values of what we're finding in the river are these dots, which are kind of all over the place. And, you know, essentially, if you look at the actual numbers here, um, we, you know, we had about a, a 10, I guess, a 10, 10 times higher bacteria levels in the lower portion of the river than we did in the upper portion of the river. Um, and basically, the, the models would not calibrate with what we were seeing actually in the field. And this really gets us to that unknown source of, of bacteria that Nancy was talking about in that, you know, we found essentially in the lower portion of the Menominee, there was a very high percentage, like over 75% of the bacteria was coming in from an unknown source. And I think it's important to note that, um, you know, we, we don't have any sewage treatment plants in this watershed because all of this sewage essentially goes to our, our regional, our metropolitan sewage district, which is um, downstream of, of this watershed. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the bacteria was really thought to, you know, mostly be coming in from, from land use. There are some, you know, municipal SSO or sanitary sewer overflow points and in the very lower portion of the river, some combined sewer overflow points. But, you know, we're finding very high bacteria levels even when um, we weren't having any of those other issues. So there's certainly um, a, big, uh, a big problem out there that we're looking at. So, you know, our, we finished our regional water quality management plan in around 2007. Um, and, and around 2008, uh, Riverkeeper, along with um, Dr. Sandra McClellan, who's at the, the UWM uh, Great Lakes Water Institute at the time, um, you know, really got together and said, you know, we, we'd really like to get a better sense of where all this bacteria is coming from. And so we started a project to really, um, you know, nail down what was going on in, in this hot spot of pollution, which ended up being about an eight-mile area um, in, along the Menominee River, um, where we really wanted to look at every single stormwater pipe in that entire section of river to figure out what was going on and, you know, really to get a better handle on where the bacteria was coming into the river. Um, we also did probably a, about an additional two miles of river on two different creeks, um, Honey Creek and Underwood Creek, which essentially were tributary or, you know, discharged into the Menominee River in that eight-mile hotspot location, if that makes sense. And so the idea was, you know, that possibly some of the bacteria could be coming in from the, the tributary rivers, and so we wanted to take a look at that. Um, and I'll show you a map of the area in a second here. Um, so, you know, basically we looked at every single outfall in that eight mile area um, and we looked, it ended up being around 230 outfalls or so, major outfalls and minor outfalls that we were looking at um, in that section. Um, essentially our protocol or what we decided to do was to, you know, for any outfall that was running in dry weather, normally that's kind of an alarm bell that, especially if it's, if it's a dry period and you have running outfalls, there, there could be a problem. So, you know, where we had outfalls running in dry weather, that was our priority to go and get water samples from those outfalls. Um, and then, you know, for basically every single outfall, we also wanted to get three wet weather samples. So essentially get, a, get an idea of what was coming out of those pipes during rain events as well. Um, we decided, um, interestingly, our, you know, the local standard, and I, I think most of the country has um, basically a fecal coliform standard for, for surface water. And that is essentially what our region, you know, has been monitoring for. Um, we decided not to really look at fecal largely because it, it's a problematic indicator. Um, and it, it basically is ubiquitous in the environment. We're finding it growing in pavement. We're finding it running off from a variety of land uses. And so, um, you know, we decided we really wanted to get a sense of, um, you know, get a better sense of, of what kind of bacteria was coming out of these outfalls. So we basically um, decided to plate all of our samples for E. coli and Enterococcus. Um, which have a, a you know more of a, a higher relationship or correlation um, with human sewage, and where we got um, basically samples that were over a thousand you know forming col basically coliform blah, blah, forming units, <laughs> basically samples that were over a thousand, um, we decided to run um, more genetic tests. So if you see on um, this is just an example of kind of what a plate looks like, and where where our samples came back over a thousand units or forming units, we decided to start running um, genetic tests. And so Dr. McClellan has um, basically developed this test where she's looking for um, bacteroides, which is, I'm guessing, not maybe familiar to a lot of people. But essentially, it's a, a, a bacteria form that is found in a lot of mammals um, in our guts. It's, very, it's found in human guts. And there are actual varieties of bacteroides that are only known to basically occur in, in human guts, if you will. So we basically decided. Um, you know, for the, the samples that were coming back very high in E. coli and Enterococcus, we were going to pay for 
um, a more expensive test to basically definitively determine that these samples um, you know, were basically had human sewage input into them. And um, it should be mentioned that you know, plating is very cheap. Um, genetic tests, when you start going that route, run about $160 a sample. So the, the, you know, there was a great expense there, and we've had to go out as a nonprofit organization and, and raise money to pay for those samples, which, as you can imagine, have gotten um, pretty expensive because we're, I think, at well over 500 samples at this point. But you know, essentially, we thought this was very important to do because um, speaking with a lot of municipalities in the past, um, with very, you know, finding very high fecal coliform levels in the river or very high even E. coli levels, there was always a, a great hesitancy to do anything about it because there was a, wasn't a sense of whether that you know, bacteria could be coming from gulls or could be coming from raccoons or other wildlife or even dogs in a very urban environment. Um, and so we really decided that it was very important to get a better sense of you know, what human um, inputs we were getting so that we, you know, that could help uh, basically convince municipalities to, to do something about the problems. So um, the map that you're seeing now is essentially this eight-mile section I was talking about before. So um, it starts up here on a street we call Burleigh Street and goes all the way down to Hawley down here. And these are the two um, creeks that come into the river, Underwood and Honey Creek, at these locations. And basically what you're seeing on the map is um, for most of, we you know, tested, as I mentioned, over 230 outfalls. These are just the ones that are positive for human bacteroides, so the ones that we suspect have human sewage coming into them. Um, it should be noted that about 80% of the, the total pipes that we tested, we believe, are positive for human sewage in this area that you know, had that great unknown bacteria component. And the dots essentially are just where we have multiple samples for each outfall are the, the basically the highest number that we've received from that outfall. So, um, and the larger the dots, are, the greater the problem, with the black dots being over one million um, you know, count numbers of human bacteroides, which is more or less equivalent to what you'd see in raw sewage, um, which we do have um, in several locations um, that we found in our, in our monitoring area. So um, you know, this basically just for this you know, essentially eight-mile section of the river um, gives you a sense of the problem that we're dealing with and that, the, frankly, the municipalities are dealing with. Um, this section is largely um, the city of Wauwatosa, but there are, is a little tiny section um, down kind of this portion and, and this portion here that's um, the city of Milwaukee. So um, basically, you know, we, we basically have a, you know, the documented now that the problem is pretty significant here. Um, and, you know, the, the whole purpose really was to try to help municipalities better prioritize, you know, where they need to do find and fix work because, you know, they're, obviously their resources are very um, small for dealing with the, with the scope of these problems. And so, you know, we really wanted to give them some real scientific information that could help them prioritize um, their efforts going forward. So this is just another way of looking at um, a portion of a subset of those 230 outfalls that I was talking about earlier. This is about 92 outfalls that we've tested multiple times for this human bacteroides test. So they've had multiple samples um, looking at genetics. And um, the highlighted outfalls, so the ones in yellow, um, basically have a very high um, human bacteroides number, which is greater than 10,000 count numbers. And, um, so, and then the arrowed outfalls that you see, there's about 10 of those. Um, are basically ones that are running, they, we say they have sewage contaminated flow, but what that means is that they're running in dry weather. So in my mind, it's, those are essentially like little sanitary sewer overflows that are happening continuously every day, um, where that water is going into the stream, has human sewage in it, and you know, and often this is, um, you know, this portion of the river runs through largely the city of Wauwatosa and, and a portion of the city of Milwaukee where, you know, there, it's, it's very common to have people paddling this section of the river to have kids playing and wading in the river a lot of rope swings and, you know, kids like finding crayfish, things like that. So, you know, it is, it's a big concern to have outfalls like this that are running 24-7, um, basically putting out human sewage into the, into the environment. Um, we found that about the, the outfalls that you see that are in the red, which is the kind of these over here, um, 25, which is about 25% of those ones where we've run multiple tests, um, are positive for this human sewage 100% of the time. So, you know, this has really given us, a, and, and we basically are sharing this information, obviously, with the municipalities. It's giving us a real, you know, top ten list, if you will, of, of the pipes that we need to fix first. Um, but, you know, really giving us some, some information about um, where are these, these sewer sheds or these storm drainage areas that are very high in, in, in human bacteria that we need to be looking at from, from a public health perspective. 
Um, so the next kind of real step, obviously, is find and fix efforts. And this, you know, gets into really, a, again, another um, combination of science and engineering. Um, clearly, once you find a smoking outfall at the end of the river, there's often, you know, very large branches of sewers that connect to that, um, that outfall. So, you know, in, in some cases, we're working now with um, the sewage district, with MMSC, um, has been going in and um, into neighborhoods where it's much easier for them to do this type of work than it is for our nonprofit. But essentially popping manholes and trying to get additional bacteroides tests within the drainage watersheds um, to get a better sense of, uh, you know, where, where if there's a certain part of the drainage watershed that we, we think has the, the human bacteria coming in. Um, the other things that we've done is obviously just um, old school, I guess, kind of uh, smoke testing. I don't know if you can really see well in this, in this picture, but um, you're basically pumping, um, you know, smoke into the sanitary sewers and looking for the non-smoking guns as it is, <laughs> running around the neighborhood looking for the, the houses that are not smoking and that could be um, illicitly connected to the storm system. Um, this actually was one small watershed in the Honey Creek area that we did find with just a smoke test that four of the houses um, were connected poorly. Um, the city subsequently has gone in and replaced the sanitary sewer and, and um, sealed the, the stormwater sewer in that area. Um, we still are finding human sewage coming out of the pipe but at much reduced levels, and so um, clearly they are finding and fixing problems in that area. Um, we've also, you know, pipe televising, Nancy showed some examples of that before and how powerful that can be. Um, one of our, our towns, the city of Wauwatosa, for example, um, found that a couple years ago they had gone in and, and up, basically tried to seal a lot of of their sewers and used a certain coupling, which is called Fernco couplings, I think, um, that were basically, you know, where the two different sections of pipe come together, a coupling there that seals the pipe, and found out, you know, subsequently that a lot of those, those couplings that were put in within the last five years even were faulty and failing and, and basically causing massive um, problems in, in different areas. So they're now going through a, a very large project to go through and address some of those areas. Um, we've also last year brought in sewage sniffing dogs. This is a really cool company that a lot of people might have heard of. They're called Environmental Canine Services, and um, they are based out of Michigan. And we had them come over and look at um, four of or three of our problem sewer sheds. And the dogs basically are trained. You know, these are very talented dogs. This one's name is Sable, um, <laughs> but they are. You know, they're trained to find cadavers. They're trained to find drugs. And now um, their owner basically has trained them to find human sewage. So they. Uh, Sable will go up to a, an outfall and if she smells human sewage, um, will bark. They have other dogs that have different uh, ways of indicating. But um, it's, it, you know, we found that it was very helpful even just getting out there with the municipality, popping a series of manholes. Um, we as humans were able to detect problems pretty instantly. And then, you know, the dogs also were able to detect areas that um, were flagged essentially for future um, televising and, and other diagnostic efforts there. Um, other uh, quick, this is the bottom obviously is just a picture of dye testing also, which can be very helpful um, for, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, when they put dye in some of the sanitary systems and the dye comes out in the river, they can get a sense of, you know, which sanitary pipes have leaks that are leaking into the storm system. Um, this is essentially a little pond that is tributary to the Menominee River. So, um, you know, all of that stuff now is, is going on, um, probably not at the, um, you know, at the speed or <laughs> extent that we would like it to. Um, but there's a couple of really um, hopeful things that are going on here that we help, are, we think are going to help us with this problem. Um, one is um, the Menominee watershed, um, watershed municipalities have come together um, largely, you know, a large group of us is part of our Southeastern Wisconsin Watershed Trust, which is a group that Nancy and I are both involved in, um, have come together with the DNR and, and basically crafted a stormwater permit or a watershed um, stormwater permit for those municipalities. It's one of four in the country right now that we know of. And, you know, one thing that we found, because this is such a huge problem in this watershed, um, was they are being required as part of their watershed permit to come up with a new testing protocol as part of their illicit discharge programs that essentially are targeted for looking at human discharge. Um, people who are familiar with those, you know, the, the current um, illicit discharge testing protocols that are required under, you know, the federal law and state laws, um, you know, a lot of that, those protocols are very um, aimed at looking at things like ammonia, which can be very helpful for, um, you know, sending up red flags for industrial illicit discharges or industrial areas that are connected um, wrongly to the stormwater pipe. Ammonia, we're, you know, we're finding locally has a very low correlation to, to sewage or to human bacteria. And so we're basically um, working with the, the cities right now to come up with a desktop analysis 
Um, the desktop analysis is, um, you know, fairly similar to um, one that's in the Center for Watershed Protection Manual on illicit discharges, but um, we're basically tweaking it for our area. But, you know, it's really looking at, um, at their whole system overall, at where they've had past um, either positive detects, obviously, of human sewage, largely from our work, or, you know, where they've had past complaints from homeowners. Um, they're looking at age of development, material, and conditions of the pipe, and, and their likelihood to, um, you know, to be having leak problems. Looking at elevations, which is what Nancy was talking about, where in certain areas they know that they have connections where the sanitary sewer maybe crosses over the storm sewer. Um, you know, looking at density of land use and, and other issues, and essentially doing a desktop analysis first, and then um, basically coming up with, um, uh, you know, a plan to go out and do outfall monitoring, specifically looking at, at human sewage. The, our local um, Department of Natural Resources um, has given them also flexibility to stop looking at major outfalls. Um, essentially, the law requires every city to monitor major outfalls that are 36 inches or greater. A lot of those outfalls, frankly, you know, we have not had major problems with, so they're going to have to test those about once every five years. But it's going to free up some time for the cities to now essentially have to start looking at those smaller, minor outfalls, and not only looking for industrial waste, but looking for human waste. And so we're basically right now still working on um, what the what essentially the monitoring component is going to look like and trying to figure out the, the easiest and cheapest way for, for the cities to do this work and also trying to figure out opportunities if there's you know, ways for citizen groups to help out um, to kind of reduce the burden um, of you know, really going out. And we basically look now at this you know, approximately 10 mile area, but we have you know, a large watershed now. And so the idea is to try to determine in other cities you know, where we might be having similar problems, you know, what's the most cost effective way of, of finding and fixing these things. Okay, so then I'm going to turn it back to Nancy now. I want to talk a little bit about what we know about the potential health impacts um, of this problem. And it's really hard to get good data. So we've got um, a study that was mentioned in the American City and County publication. Our 7 million people are sickened by contaminated drinking and recreational water every year. Well, we don't really know what proportion of that contamination is coming from leaky pipes and, and what occurs in other ways. Um, locally, um, this group, including Sandra McClellan and Dr. Gorlick, <clears throat> have been looking at admissions to the emergency room, and they've um, found gastrointestinal illness that appears to be related to the leaky pipes problem. Um, they cite uh, another study that finds 19 million cases of gastrointestinal illness from public water supplies annually. Uh, but in their own work looking at emergency room admissions, they found no correlation with rainy weather. Oh, actually, I said that wrong, didn't I? There is a correlation with rainy weather, as I suggested earlier. What they didn't find a correlation with was combined sewer overflows. We do have an area of combined sewer here. And a lot of people blame the combined sewer overflows for all of the water quality problems that we've got. But we know that that's largely untrue. And here again, they're even in the case of the sewage um, in the streams problem doesn't appear to have a correlation with the combined sewer overflow. One of the problems with using this kind of health data, of course, is that when people get sick, they often don't go to the doctor with just diarrheal illness unless it's really bad. And even if they go to the doctor, the doctor may not report it to public health authorities and they may never try to track down what the cause was. And so this, I think, when we look at gastrointestinal illness, it's really like the canary in the coal mine because what we're really worried about is that new disease that um, where the, the water becomes the vector for or passing it along. And so whether it's, you know, you know, we, we've talked about bird flu, for example, and SARS and those kinds of things, and those have not necessarily been related to either public water supply or recreational waters, but the next disease could be. Um, there is um, some more conservative estimates and, and some important caveat that I want to put on it. The Centers for Disease Control, um, they only uh, 
counted 18 outbreaks of waterborne disease from recreational waters in the most recent data. It made 94 individuals sick. But importantly, most of those outbreaks are from swimming pools and spas. They're not from playing in urban rivers and streams. They're not from going to the beach. So, so you know, do we have evidence that this threat that Cheryl and I have been talking about is actually making people sick? We can't quite say that, but the threat to us seems pretty clear nonetheless. The other thing that I wanted to point out about the health risk is that we talk a lot about um, geese and raccoons and cows and uh, dogs being the source of fecal contamination and taking various kinds of measures to deal with that. Um, I really tried to dig into this question, and there's not a lot of evidence, but there, there are some estimates that show that cattle pose a greater risk than pigs and chickens. But even the risk from cattle manure in the water is 25 to 100 times less than the risk if it's human fecal that's in the water. And that's on a, on a per volume basis, so the same amount of cattle manure to the same amount of human sewage. So that really leads to a policy question, which is where we want to end. Where do we put our efforts? Uh, you know, do we do campaigns to get people to pick up their dog poo, which is important, or do we really need to get our private laterals inspected and fixed? So what are planners' roles? Well, currently, uh, planners are not doing a whole lot. Um, they're doing more than they think they are. Um, I interviewed a small number of planners here in, in southeast Wisconsin, and when I first contacted them, they said, well, I'm not doing nothing. I don't know anything about this. And then as we started to talk, it turned out that they were more involved. APA did a task force on rebuilding America's water infrastructure. But through the entire report, there's no connection between the leaking pipes that are implied, at least, by their recommendations and public health risks. Public health doesn't come up at all in the APA task force report. Um, I think that planners really have an opportunity to get involved here, and I think they have an ethical duty in terms of our need to be um, engaged with public health issues. I think we can be involved in assessing the magnitude of the challenges, getting it on our local agendas, our state uh, public health and DNR agendas, as well as on the federal agenda to get some funding. Uh, we need to work collaboratively with other professionals and we need to figure out where we can use our tax dollars most effective. And I think we can also be involved in helping to come up with some innovative policies. Um, it's also important to recognize that a lot of times the person at the municipality who supervises building inspectors is, in fact, uh, a trained planner. And um, planners have, therefore, a unique opportunity to make sure that that underground infrastructure doesn't get backfilled before the, um, the inspections occur. Um, I want to go on to some of the policies that we might look at. Uh, way down in the future, we might look at what's called resilient water infrastructure, where um, we distribute our water cleaning infrastructure so there's less dependence on pipes. Uh, it's sort of like smart growth on, growth on steroids, um, but it's probably not going to help us with our existing development. It's probably going to be new development that moves in that direction over the next, I don't know, 20 or 30 years probably. What we need now is um, to deal with problems, for example, like the affordability when pipes need repairs. These are the private pipes. The cities generally are not going to pay to get them repaired. It's going to be a burden on property owners, but think especially of low-income property owners that are just making their mortgage payments and keeping up their roof and what have you, and now they get hit with you know, $2,000, $5,000, $7,000 bill to fix or replace their sewer pipe. Um, so there are a number of policy programs that have been put in place in Knoxville. They've got a grant program that's targeted to low-income households. In the uh, National League of Cities has a program called the Service Line Warranty Program that's available in 46 states, where for a monthly fee of just $9.50 a month, you get coverage of $4,000 to $8,000 in case your sewer line does need to be repaired. 
And then um, Missouri law actually authorizes local insurance of laterals. So those are some tools you might want to look at. Um, we also need some incentives to inspect laterals. Here in Milwaukee, uh, when I was talking about the Elm Grove program that was inspecting laterals, that was actually made possible by our Metropolitan Sewage District that created this 10-year fund to provide uh, funding to local communities to do that kind of lateral inspection and then helping private owners to fix their lines. There are also regulations popping up around the country. In San Francisco Bay, municipalities are now required to have ordinances requiring that the lateral be inspected at sale or when there's a major renovation. Campbellsport, Wisconsin requires inspection when the main is replaced. Chisholm, Minnesota requires it at the time of property sale. I also read that Delaware County in Pennsylvania is considering that kind of an inspection requirement. So this is where we're, we're going to um, close and go into questions. Here's what I think the bottom lines are. We have both national um, academic information and local data here in Milwaukee that suggests that leaky pipes and misconnected pipes are a big part of some of our water quality problems, that there is a clear public health risk, though the magnitude of that risk is unclear at this time. Um, and that we've got some policy challenges ahead. We need more cost-effective ways of figuring out where that fecal is coming from in our water, the kinds of um, approaches that Cheryl talked about, whether it's the dogs or whether it's the desktop analysis. And then we also have the policy challenge of making sure that people aren't hit with a uh, financial um, responsibility that they're not in a position to fix. And so I think as planners, we have a responsibility to look at that side of the issue as well. So my hope is that planners will become much more engaged in this problem, and I'm hoping that you will think that too. Great. Thank you. We already have some questions coming in, so let's just jump right in. <clears throat> okay. The first question. Okay. Have you considered developing small treatment facilities to treat contaminated water coming from problem out outfalls until such time as the sources, leaky pipes, are identified and fixed? Well, I can start. Um, this is Cheryl. So, you know, when we were doing our regional water quality management plan, uh, um, this obviously came up as, you know, a huge issue. And, and, you know, finding some of these issues in certain areas where you might have 100 houses or 1,000 houses tributary to a stormwater outfall, you know, it's like finding a you know, proverbial needle in the haystack. And so, you know, one of the um, recommendations that we talked about a lot at our committee was not really doing like little mini treatment plants, but really looking at UV filtration, which I know that they've done in Atlanta and some other areas where you would put like some sort of a UV, um, I guess, treatment device at the end of the outfall to, to clean the, the stormwater until, you know, the time that you could actually find where, where the problem was coming in. Um, I can mention that that, um, you know, sitting around a table with probably a few dozen municipal representatives and treatment plant representatives who were on this advisory committee um, took that suggestion very negatively <laughs> um, and um, really so much so that the, our regional planning commission took that recommendation out of our final report. Um, I, I think against our will and others will. But, you know, I think that the sense from a lot of the municipalities was, you know, that would be way too expensive to do that, that, you know, the, the maintenance would be very expensive. And, you know, but at the same time, when, you know, we, like one of our, our areas that we're working in right now, um, which is one of those pipes that was kind of equivalent to human sewage, I mean, it's already, you know, a 2 to $3 million project to do a lot of the outfall work. Or, I mean, the, they're basically doing lateral work, they're, you know, replacing sanitary and stormwater mains in that area. So, you know, you're talking about millions of dollars, um, you know, for that work as well. And clearly, you know, we, we want that work to happen because it's coming up with a solution to the problem. But, you know, in, in a lot of other areas, it's not as cut and dry um, where these, the sources are in some of these areas. And in some areas, we, you know, we suspect that where we're not finding leaky pipes or leaky laterals, that we might actually have just contaminated groundwater issues. So, um, that are, you know, basically getting into the trenches and getting into the, the pipes themselves. So, you know, I think that there's definitely other solutions we need to be looking at, um, although I'd say, you know, there's great resistance. And, and um, that's, you know, one of our biggest issues going forward and the fact that the municipalities, you know, their priority, you know, has always been, 
you know, really attacking those outfalls that are causing basement backup issues first, which makes complete sense, you know, because it's obviously another huge public health issue if people have sewage going into their basements, you know, during wet weather events. But, you know, there's, there's been less, um, you know, real, I guess, incentive for them to, to deal with some of these issues. And I, frankly, and you know, have had municipal engineers tell me in the past that the best thing that our group could do as a nonprofit would be to educate people to not use the river. And I mean, and I think that's really coming, you know, that's kind of the opposite of what we're all about. We want to get people, you know, to enjoy the river. We want to make the rivers, you know, clean enough that they're fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think I, I do sense from a lot of our municipal, municipal folks is that, you know, they're overwhelmed with the extent of the problem and the fact that they don't have enough resources um, to deal with it. You know, the SRF and some of the other federal programs that, that, you know, pay for a lot of the infrastructure work is, you know, continually gutted. And, you know, locally in Wisconsin, we have a, basically a, an act, we call it Act 10, but our governor put in place legislation that makes it um, impossible for local cities to raise their taxes to pay for things like this. So, you know, um, I, I think that we do need to think out of the box and, you know, we're hoping to, you know, that our research is really helping them prioritize the capital money that they do have um, to really get the biggest bang for the buck. Um, but there, you know, there's been great resistance to doing, you know, anything really to address this problem. I, I think the main game changer that we see locally is that we have TMBLs now coming out for three of our rivers, including this river that I was talking about today. Um, and one of the TMBLs is bacteria TMBL. Um, so we do hope that that will give us another tool to really, um, you know, incentivize or convince the municipalities that they really need to start addressing this problem because they are going to have to get bacteria reductions as part of their TMBLs. And I'm okay, great. to add, I, would, I guess I have two, two things. One is that I think you're asking the right question. The other thing I'd point out is that there, I, I hadn't mentioned the research that's showing that there's fecal getting into wells that's not even related necessarily to leaky septic tanks. Um, and it's getting into deep wells and, and in, in urban areas. And so um, there's, there's evidence that um, just dealing with what's getting into the surface water is just a part of the problem. But I think you're asking the right question in terms of looking at different options. And that is what we need to be doing as planners. Um, there actually is a well question, so I'll just jump to that since we're there. Um, have you combined your research with a private well testing program? Uh, we have not been engaged in the private well issue um, personally because um, we're in an area where we use Lake Michigan water for our drinking water and we're primarily about the water quality in the rivers and streams. However, there are some other scientists here in Wisconsin who have been looking at the well issue. And, and so, for example, in the Madison area of Wisconsin, they found that 8 to 42 percent of wells tested in the generally urbanized area of Madison, um, 8 to 42 percent had detectable uh, human enteric viruses. So, so there's some of that work going on as well. Okay, um, next question. It seems as though Milwaukee is being very proactive in terms of addressing sewage leakage, sewer leakage. Do you have any sense on where this level of effort ranks with other areas of the country? Who is leading and who is lagging? So I've been really trying to find out where people are. And, and when I've been searching for policies, that's really been um, sort of how I've found these places. So. I think Milwaukee is definitely at the, at the head of the pack. It's clear to me that San Francisco Bay is at the head of the pack with us. Um, I, I looked at Seattle. Um, I particularly looked at Seattle because a few years ago, the then head of their sewage uh, system was helping us here in Milwaukee. And he had suggested that we get uh, an ordinance in place to inspect laterals at the time of property transfer. And that didn't end up getting recommended, but I thought that meant that maybe the Seattle area had such uh, a situation. And I wasn't able to find anything that, um, that suggested that was the case. If there's anybody from Seattle on the line, uh, please write in to let us know. Or, or if there are other communities out there 
anywhere um, that actually have been working at this problem, I'd really love to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, we know locally we did have a town, Mequon, Wisconsin, a couple years ago, which tried to um, basically pass an ordinance that when the house was sold, you know, they'd have to do private lateral inspection and repair. It, it, did, it was one of our communities that tends to be more affluent community, uh, as opposed to the city of Milwaukee, where that would be a huge problem. But, you know, it, frankly, um, I think it did pass the city council, as if memory serves, in Mequon, but was litigated, um, because there were some people in, in town that were very unhappy about the ordinance. And so I think... Ultimately, it, it didn't go anywhere, but it, um, you know, as far as, I, I do think that we are probably, um, you know, a lot further on than a lot of other municipalities um, throughout the country. I think a lot of people just aren't really looking at this, this problem at all. Um, clearly, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on SSOs and CSOs, as, you know, there really should be. I mean, those are obviously huge issues, but I think there's been a lot less effort, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, basically stormwater outfalls and then discharging human sewage into the waterways. One of the reasons why, I think, is, is the way that the federal regulations are, are basically set out, and I know each state probably has a little bit of um, variability with how they, you know, they implement their, storm, their municipal stormwater permits and, and programs. But you know, basically here, um, you know, legally, the, the cities only have to check those major outfalls, which are these 36-inch pipes and greater. That leaves a huge amount of pipes that, frankly, cities aren't even looking at at all. Um, they're only testing the large pipes, and they're largely looking for industrial waste. Um, with you know a lot of the a lot of the tests right now that are proposed by you know that are in the EPA guidance for example are very much geared toward looking for industrial and commercial pollutants. They're not really looking. They're not geared at all um, at really looking for human bacteria coming out of them. So you know it's one thing that we're working out with our municipalities. I think they, there's clearly you know willingness by a lot of them to really try to address this problem and concern. But at the same time, you know they're they're not. They, most of them are doing zero bacteria monitoring now. So we need to figure out you know, whether it makes sense for them to, you know, train their, their stormwater engineers on how to do this, this type of work, or at least maybe the, the more cheap kind of E. coli enterococcus test first, and then, you know, partnering with us and, and maybe a local university later to do additional testing. Um, you know, but we're trying to figure out kind of what is the most cost-effective way of them doing that, because clearly, um, you know, that's going to be a big barrier going forward as well, that they're going to have to start testing for bacteria and other things where, you know, now most of our municipalities are really just doing ammonia tests and, and kind of doing the basic tests that they're required to do by law. So I think, you know, um, I, I get a sense that there aren't a lot of people doing this, but, you know, I think one of the reasons we wanted to do this webinar today is to really let people know about the problem and, and you know, really encourage others to start looking at this as a major bacteria source, especially, you know, in, in our region, for example, a lot of our water quality parameters are, are improving. Things like oxygen temperature are getting better. Um, bacteria is getting continuously worse here, um, which really, you know, gets to that problem of we have very old pipes that are, you know, continuing to degrade. I think that's clearly a, a national problem and, and, you know, regionally in certain areas like the Northeast, probably a more severe program, or sorry, more severe problem than in other areas of the country. But I think it is a really big problem that we're all facing, and I don't think there's enough people that are really paying attention to the, to the problem. Um, related to what you just mentioned, <clears throat> there is a comment, and maybe you could expand a little bit more if you have, if either one of you have any information on it. Um, in some older, predominantly East Coast cities, the issues aren't so much with privately owned laterals as with ancient city-owned pipes that are leaking and a lack of, of tax base to pay for those repairs. Um, could you expand a little more if you have any knowledge on on this? Well, yeah. You know, what I would say is, yeah, I, and that's what the national studies have focused on as well as the publicly owned pipes. And we know that those aren't getting replaced on the right sort of schedule, and many of them are very leaky. I, I just need to caution people that, well, that therefore may be the lowest hanging fruit, that when they get done with that work, they may not have solved the problem because there's an equal amount in terms of miles of pipe that are laterals that are probably in the same bad condition, if not worse condition, as the municipal sewer pipes. Yeah, we've had several, like the city of Milwaukee spent about three million in one um, storm sewer shed redoing the sanitary um, pipe that they owned and redoing the stormwater pipe. I will say I think that did capture probably about 90 percent of the problem as far as we can tell. Um, and there were four houses that were, were not connected properly. But, you know, we're still seeing some base levels of human contamination in some of those areas. So, in a way, that can be a little discouraging for the municipalities. But, 
Um, I, I think, you know, when we, where we've seen massive reductions in bacteria, we're still very happy about that. And um, we clearly have more work to do, but I think you're right. I mean, I think most cities that, you know, where I've gone to meetings just in our own area are at like a 1% replacement schedule. So, you know, you do the math, some of these pipes aren't going to be replaced for 100 years, and the lifetime of the pipe was not meant to be 100 years. Um, you know, and that said, you know, as a huge issue, and, and the just basically old aging pipes in a lot of the, the East Coast cities, and even, you know, Midwest cities where we have decreasing tax base is a huge issue. And I think one of the things that we need to think about, and I mentioned, I alluded earlier that we have this issue in Wisconsin where the cities, you know, even some cities who are more progressive who really want to attack this problem, you know, in part because of the water contamination, but in part because of basement backup issues in some cases, um, aren't able to even increase their taxes. Um, even where people, you know, referendums, people have voted to increase their taxes to address this issue, um, are not able to because of, they can't increase their property taxes. But I know a lot of us, you know, locally are, are looking at um, to, trying to figure out whether or not there's more innovative funding sources that could help us um, address this problem. You know, clearly politically, sales tax is not an easy thing to pass, but I know, you know, Minnesota and Iowa have both had some success passing taxes that were aimed at you know, providing a, a dedicated revenue stream for, for water infrastructure projects. So I think we're definitely looking at looking whether or not, um, you know, we could think of a more innovative way of getting some funding together to, to address this. And, you know, a, a lot of that would, I think, go to the municipal problems and as well as the, the laterals. We, we have a two-part question. Um, the, the first part, it, going along with this, how much have you spent on, on that, the Milwaukee Menominee, I can't say that word, river study, how, how much money was spent on that? And then secondly, more broadly, um, I guess, was, was there private or grant money involved? And are either of you aware of, of programs, either you know private funding or uh, even state funding or federal funding or anything that's available to, to conduct some of these studies? The watershed restoration plans for the Menominee watershed and the Kinnick watershed were done with Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funds, um, which obviously is only available to places within the Great Lakes Basin. Um, the regional plan was part of, you know, a standard Clean Water Act 208 planning process that the sewage district needs to do, and so they really funded it out of their, their sewer fees, um, partnering with our regional planning agency and the uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I don't know how much that regional plan cost, but millions, yeah. Well, I would say on that regional plan, I'm, I'm not entirely sure either of the number, but it was, you know, millions of dollars. But as Nancy mentioned, that's part of the two-way planning that I think everyone's pretty much required to do anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as our work, I guess our monitoring work, um, we, I, I guess that we've spent probably close to $150,000. Um, most of that funding has come from a variety of sources. We have gotten some grants from our local um, Department of Natural Resources, um, largely through a program which we call our Area of Concern program, which is, uh, you know, basically Great Lakes contaminated hotspots that are eligible for, uh, for certain funding sources um, for monitoring and also remediation work. So. We've been lucky enough to get some funding from through that program. We have gotten some private funding um, for our nonprofit from a, a fund called Fund for Lake Michigan, which is just essentially a private foundation that, that funds water quality work that's paid for some of this work. Um, we do we think we're hopefully getting um, additional EPA funding to um, continue this work for another three years. Uh, basically, and also we're looking at the Connecticut River watershed, which I didn't mention as part of this, but we're starting to really look at the, the hot spot areas in that watershed and, and looking for, for human in that watershed as well. One of the, the new things that we're going to start doing, which I'm, we're pretty excited about, is we're, EPA is going to give us some funding. We're hoping it's going to be an, an additional $300,000 for th the next three years, um, is to do some in-stream monitoring. Um, and that will also, basically because, you know, I think a lot of folks know, um, you know, we're only really looking at fecal coliform locally because that's what the recreational use standards are. Um, for essentially the water quality standards for bacteria here in Wisconsin. Um, fecal, obviously, we don't seem, is not a very uh, helpful standard. The EPA, the new standards that have come out that some people might be familiar with, the new recreational use standards, um, the states have two years to pick one of two proposed standards that the EPA has put forth, and those are both enterococcus-based standards. 
um, which we think are, are slightly better than the fecal. Um, in our area, we're hoping that this, this new grant that we're getting from EPA is going to help us do in-stream bacteroides testing. So essentially, we'll be able to help us identify areas in other parts of the watershed where we have very, human, very high levels of human bacteria in-stream. In um, it's kind of a way to help us prioritize additional areas where we might have to do this stormwater outfall monitoring, which obviously is much more intensive and, and kind of and expensive. Um, so we're hoping that we can start looking, you know, in stream in different rivers to see what are the human bacteria sources, not only to help us prioritize future project areas, but also to help us, you know, over time really um, also monitor our success of, of finding and fixing and, and the impact that that's having, you know, in the actual uh, river water quality in, in the stream. So, yeah, I mean, I guess the answer is, you know, we've gotten, you know, kind of funding from, I guess, a diversity of places. And frankly, a lot of um, in-kind support from our sewage district who's been, um, you know, basically paying for a lot of the up-the-pipe samples and, um, you know, helping with a lot of diagnostic work as part of, you know, the budget that they get from taxpayers. And, um, you know, a lot of in-kind support as well from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee who's been very helpful and, um, you know, and getting students involved in helping run some of the samples and, and help keep the cost down. Great. Um, we had someone just make a comment, and I think it's it's a good point, and I would like to hear anything that you have to say about this. Um, that planners need to get the education to their elected officials, and the problem is officials might not want to deal with the issue. So unless the public cries out, elected officials might not have any incentive to do the right thing and to look into this. And I know that you had mentioned um, some a few states that have had some success in in addressing this issue. Do you have any um, suggestions for tactics on how to broach the topic with the elected officials, or you know, to 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 make this situation really come to light and become an important topic to talk about? My, my initial reaction is that elected officials are always interested when you say we are spending our money in a dumb way. Um, and so some of the things that um, cities spend money on, um, they can't get rid of completely because, for example, stormwater regulations at the federal level require that there be information and education. And, and a lot of that money goes to things like pick up after your dog. Um, but, but there are other ways that that money is being spent on water quality that may not be addressing these potentially critical vectors uh, to it that could affect human health. And so I think if you can combine the message of we're not, not spending our money in the smart way and this is a, a potential catastrophe waiting in the wings and we can actually get some really good publicity for how forward-thinking we are by, by doing this kind of work, I think that that would be possible. I'd also point out, you don't have to do the big expensive regional plan or watershed restoration plan to begin the work. If you know you've got high fecal levels in any of your stream segments, it's just a matter of going out, taking a look at what the storm sewers look like. Um, um, seeing if you can identify just through the sampling that's routinely done where some of the hot spots are and then, you know, just work on a really small pilot basis um, with the civil engineer from the community that seems to be involved and, and I think partnering up with the, the um, other professionals in city government and just trying some pilot projects to see what you find out and then if you find the same kinds of things we are, then you have a real story to take to the elected officials. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, most municipalities, right, they have stormwater permits, and so they have to do some level of testing already. Um, as I previously mentioned, you know, we, we think a lot of what they're looking at isn't necessarily helping us get at, at this problem specifically, but we have had some success going out with stormwater engineers in certain communities who, you know, frankly are going out there and having to test these pipes at least once a year anyway. Um, and, you know, I think there's real opportunity to, um, since they're, you know, basically required to do this work anyway, to partner with them, um, you know, not only for, I guess, community groups to partner with them to bring costs down, but to really just get split samples when they're already out there taking a sample, 
they can get an additional sample that could be sent to a local lab or a local university. Um, you know, they're basically already spending the level of effort to have the staff out there doing a water sample anyway looking for ammonia. They could take a, a second sample and, and have that run for bacteria. I think especially, um, you know, where you have pipes running in dry weather, that's the real low-hanging fruit as far as we're concerned. I mean, you know, we have the, the pipes that are running in dry weather, you know, like 80% of the ones that we found are very high in bacteria and dry weather and even higher in wet weather. Um, and so, you know, basically I think, you know, convincing municipalities and people who are already out there doing the monitoring because it's required to really focus maybe more on those dry running outfalls and, and really looking at any more depth with, at those I think could be really helpful as well to, to figuring out whether you have a problem in your area. And, you know, I guess just kind of piggybacking on, on existing resources and time that's already being spent. Um, is kind of one way. And I think the other is, you know, I mentioned briefly our watershed permit, but one of the ways that we've been able to sell it, I think, to some of the local municipalities is to give them some flexibility um, with the regulators that they can, you know, basically not, not sample some of the quote-unquote clean pipes um, every year, which is required in their permit, but instead every five years. And then so that gives them the ability to spend more time on, on looking at um, pipes that could be, you know, potential sources of human sewage which in some cases are smaller pipes that haven't been looked at before, and in other cases could be pipes that they have been monitoring, but they haven't been looking for the right parameters, for example. So I think that that has given them um, the ability to do more of this work because it's essentially, they can tell their elected officials that it's, it's essentially the same work that they've always been doing, but they're doing it in a smarter way, kind of back to what Nancy was saying. Great. Okay, um, we'll take one more question and, and then we'll wrap up. Um, for those that didn't get their questions answered, um, feel free to contact Nancy or Cheryl. So the last question, um, given that Milwaukee has a unique experience from the out outbreak some years ago, do you think that unfortunately other serious tragedies will be necessary before the Milwaukee leadership in this clean drinking water initiative becomes a true national focus? Um, they, you know, and frankly, we have kids out, you know, out today probably waiting in some of our local rivers where we're having these problems. And so, you know, I, I mean, I think that we we don't want to wait until we have a massive epidemic. I mean, hopefully that would never happen. But I mean, I think, you know, the, the cities certainly have an obligation to to find and fix these illicit discharges. And um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's you know, it's public health. It's our it's our kids. It's people playing in the stream. It's people paddling. Um, people waiting in, in these rivers that are, are most likely the ones getting sick. And, um, you know, and, and it's hard to kind of get a, get a hand, handle on how big that problem is because a lot of times when people get sick, they correlate it with what they've eaten for dinner. They don't think it, you know, they don't connect it to the, them playing in the river the day before or, or whatever. But so, I mean, I think it's, it's true. It's, it's a hard problem to kind of frame and, and to address. Um, but, yeah, I certainly hope that you know, I think we're, we're all on the same page here that we want to get our rivers to a point where they're fishable and swimmable um, and drinkable. And, um, you know, I think, you know, I'm, we're hoping that we can, we can kind of bring the municipalities and the decision makers along and, and helping, you know, clean up our rivers and, and make our communities more healthy. So this is all I have. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Nancy and Cheryl. This was eye-opening. Um, <laughs> I can't say it's a very happy topic, but hopefully um, the folks on the line will take this back to their departments and their local officials. Um,
I'm going to go ahead and just change back to me just so that I can wrap up with a few comments. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone again that you can log your CM credits for attending today's webcast by visiting planning.org slash CM and select today's date and presentation. Again, um, it is available for 1.5 CM credits. We're recording the webcast. It will be available on YouTube and you can always email for a PDF of the presentation. So this concludes today's session. Again, if you didn't get your question answered, feel free to contact Cheryl or Nancy or myself. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Nancy and Cheryl, for taking time out of your day for this. And uh, everybody have a great weekend. Thanks a lot.